Now, the reason that I'm telling you what I'm doing here, here on this in, in regards to this is because I wanted to manage the weeds this first year, which meant that I was going to have to plant a little bit later because I knew that when the, when the, the weeds would start growing, I needed to plow over and over and over and allow little seedlings to grow of the weeds, let them catch up on the warm weather that we had throughout February, March, April. And as it did, I would plow them over and over and over, killing out any potential of them growing. Now, I'm not going to kill them all out this first year. This was all raw pasture. Every bit of this was raw pasture. This was all growing up in grass and weeds this tall. So I, uh, you can see a, a pile over here. I got a pile down there. I composted all of the weeds, drug out off all of the grass with my rake blade from the back of the tractor. Didn't dig it out, I raked it out. But I raked it deep. I raked it deep, two feet deep, trying to disturb, mess up all the roots as possible. Now, everyone's going to debate between no-till and till gardens. This is too large of a garden for me to do a no-till. And I've got a tractor that does the work, okay? So I'm gonna use that tractor as much as possible so that I don't have as much hand work to do later on. Now, these three rows of onions have never been weeded at all. And this is May. They have some weeds around them, but you can see the onions are dominant. And then right here, you can start seeing some Crowder peas coming up. You see the Crowder peas coming up? The Crowder peas are coming up real nicely. I have several rows of Crowder peas that are coming up through here. They're almost weedless. So does it take work? Yes. There were, there were probably, and I'm not exaggerating, I plowed this entire garden up, not with a tiller, not with a rototiller, not with a pulverizer. I plowed it up with a cultivator. Let me show you. This is what I use right here. These are, they go deep. They're spring loaded to catch roots, rocks. I had a lot of rocks. This area here is full of rocks. Still have a lot of rocks in the soil. But I can tell you, I plowed this yesterday and that up there yesterday above the Crowder Peas. I can stick my arm down into that soil up to my elbow. It's so soft. If I stood on it, I would sink down in it. It's so powdery soft. Holds moisture really well too. And where the biochar is, that holds a lot of the, the natural nutrients that are in the ground and it makes it like a time release capsule. This is an organic garden. There's no chemicals in this garden. Now, get back to what I was talking to, about, to you about a moment ago. This has not been weeded at all, has not been tilled for a couple months, and it's managing the weeds very well. You see the undergrowth under this, under this tree? See the undergrowth under that tree? That's what I had all the way through this. So what you're doing here, when you plow over and over and over, and you do it through the warm, moist season of the early spring, which is pushing you to plant a little later that first year, but you're also managing your weeds. So this year I'm gonna have weeds, but I'm not gonna have as many if I didn't do it the way I did it. Again, I probably plowed every bit of this 40 times. No exaggeration, at least 40 times. Very good soil. Nothing's been added to it. This is just Appalachian Mountain Valley soil coming off the top of my mountains over thousands of years. And I'm going to have, I do believe, one of the best gardens that I could even imagine in the first year, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year. But I am going to compost. I am going to add compost every year. Uh, it's going to be mixed in with the soil and it's going to be compost that has uh, naturally been sterilized 
uh, from any kind of weed infestation. And I'm gonna do an extremely good job at doing that. Now on the other side, let me show you this. If you'll look real close, right here is a compost pile that I haven't even composted yet, but it's completely covered up with growth because I haven't composted it yet. Back here is a compost pile I've already removed and I've added it to the compost pile down here. And you can see this one's doing really well. You can dig in that one with your hands because I've been stirring it. And, um, but I'm gonna stir this one too. Underneath that top growth is, is soil, good soil, good topsoil. It's mixed in with the roots and the dead grass, dead weeds, anything that was there. And I'm also gonna mix that in with some, uh, some browns. You know, I've got a sawmill across the road. I don't have one. I have a neighbor that has a sawmill across the road. And uh, we're gonna mix in some old sawdust, the good old black sawdust from pine. It's already composted 90%. Give it a good kickstart. We're going to throw in some, some fresh compost. And we're going to keep throwing scraps from the garden. We're going to create some really, really good soil to mix in with this. And over about three years period of time, we're going to have even a better garden than we have now. So now to this tree here. This tree, I noticed when I was planting this morning, is casting a shadow all the way down from the morning sun east is that way east is that way that is west sun's coming up back here and it's casting a shadow straight across the garden so i'm concerned a little bit for some of the plants like the corn and the beans that i've planted down here because they're not really getting full sun until three o'clock in the afternoon which is fine on a extremely scorching day they're getting indirect sun and filter sun but they're not getting full sun this first year is going to be an experiment so i'll keep you posted on how that goes I'm not sure how it goes i don't want to cut this big white oak if i can help it i can take some limbs out but the top canopy is really what is catching a lot of the the sun and shadowing out a big portion of the garden now this garden it's hard to tell from this video but it's over it's approximately five eighths to three quarters of an acre total. So it's a fairly good sized garden. And, um, and that's going to feed not only me, but it's going to feed my kids, my grandkids, and it's going to be spread around. And on the other side of this ridge, I have another pasture over here. That's going to have a few pigs that we're going to be adding to the farm here soon. Oh, I let a secret out, didn't I? And, uh, and as I add those to the farm, the homestead is going to be taking some good documentaries around the pigs and what we're going to be doing there. But at the end, you, you can imagine right here the garden is. Then I've got one patch of forest. Then the next patch pasture is going to have the pigs, the scraps off the garden. Don't have to go back toward the cabin. They can go straight up in the bucket of the tractor. Dump it over into the pig lot around the corner. And we'll run electric fence so that in the um, in that patch of forest they'll be able to enjoy the shade. And we have some nice big shade trees. I'll show that that paddock area of for the pigs to you on another video. But at the end of the season, when the garden is at its end, we can actually portion off parts of the garden and allow the pigs to travel on into the garden and help us forage into the garden. So I'm excited about the cycle that we're creating here, the natural cycle between the animals and, um, and the garden. And we're also not allowing any of our animals to get into the streams or the creek or the lake. That's not going to happen. We are in the middle of building. This is a, this is a new project here. So even though I've had this property for 21 years, this is a new project and I'm relocated here now. And, um, but we're fencing off all animals from other than my dog, we're fit in, if we're riding horses or something like that, our neighbors riding, riding horses, that's fine. They can go wherever they want to go. But, but we're keeping the farm animals out of our water sources. We want to keep them pristine clean. And so all the water sources for the animals to be able to drink is going to be piped to where they need it and not to contaminate any of our streams.
So that's important because you have people downstream that you need to be cautious of when you're working animals. Uh, and you don't have to range your animals into the streams. Uh, you can if you want to, if that's what you feel like you have a right to do. I'm not here to uh, challenge you in any way. Uh, we've done that before in our farms growing up. But um, in this setting here, I'm not going to do that. I don't want algae growing in my lake. Uh, manure, other things that get into the streams will uh, generate a biological cycle and, and, uh, and it will put algae in the lake and it will take the oxygen level down in the lake and that will be something that will affect what we're gonna be doing with the lake. We're gonna be stocking the lake with trout, which is gonna be one of our sources of meat. I love trout better than I like catfish and catfish sometimes can, can muddy up the water in the lake and we wanna keep the water crystal clear. So everything is a plan and a purpose and a strategy and, uh, and by the way, the bees are doing extremely well. I do have to go to the bee yard tomorrow, pick up some more, and, um, and uh, to work on some more colonies and to do what needs to be done there. The flora up here in the mountains, in the Appalachian Mountains, even though further south and maybe even further in toward the coast here in North Carolina, you're going to see a lot of the flow, the honey flow has started to slow down because uh, that depends a lot upon residential and farmlands that are lower elevations. I'm at a higher elevation, so I'm behind them in time. Uh, the weather they're getting now uh, will be the weather I'm getting a month from now. So I'm going to have at least another month and a half, at least another month and a half of good honey flow coming in, which is going to be great for the hives. And... Um, and I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited about all the different things we got going and all the different animals that we're going to be having uh, move in here with us at the farm. We're, we're here to help any way we possibly can. And one of the things that we're driving for is to spread the message of non-GMO um, organic farming. Uh, I seen a post on Facebook earlier today about it was in a beekeeping group and somebody asked the question, how do I trim around my beehives? Uh, how far away do I have to be to spray it, spray Roundup? And I mean, some people are like, you know, just spray Roundup. It doesn't matter. I mean, I've seen these types of statements. It bothered me. And then I've seen other statements that bothered the poster where people were jumping in there like I would uh, and say, never use Roundup. Never use glyphosate on your property especially around your bees, but don't use it on your property whatsoever. It's poison. It's cancerous to you. It's uh, carcinog carcinogenic. Uh, it's not healthy for the environment. It's not healthy for you, and it'll stay in the ground for longer than you'll live. And um, so stay chemical free. I mean, that's, that's the trick is to being healthy and to living longer and to increasing your risks uh, or decreasing your risks of ever getting cancer uh, is to go as organic as possible and to uh, you know eat as many vegetables and clean meats berries that are high in polyphenols and um, and antioxidants that will in other words you're not only focused on not putting the poisons the toxins the free radical molecules into your body and your life but you're also focused on cleaning them out with the foods and the nutrition you take. And, uh, and that intake of all those polyphenols and, and, free, and, uh, and antioxidants that you put into your system that are able to counteract those free radical molecules, those toxin molecules, it's amazing what a difference it will make in your life. It is amazing the difference that your life will be, the strength you'll have, the mental capacity you'll have, uh, the health you'll have to be able to stick around and enjoy life a lot longer. And I know it's getting dark. You can tell the sun has already gone down. The camera's showing up much better than it is out here. I'm surprised. I look like I'm in the daylight on the camera. But in reality, I've, if you'll notice, you look close enough, you can already start, start to see some lightning bugs starting to, uh, to glow behind me. And uh, I love lightning bugs. It's that time of year. So anyway... Thank you for joining me here on my YouTube channel. Please subscribe. And um, I'm very happy about the lake being 
cleaned up around and it's going to help when the grandkids come up and go swimming and um, and that way they're not as afraid uh, of a frog or a, a snake or whatever, you know, when they go swimming. So thank you so much for being part of the Welch Family Homestead uh, vlog today. God bless.